<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Really excited for today. Today, February 11th, is the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So this is always a big month for us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Every February, we kick all the men out and we host exclusively women in science, adventure, exploration, uh, and conservation from all over the world. So we've had an awesome month so far. We still have oh, at least two and a half weeks of events to go, probably 40 plus by the time all is said and done. And we're continuing today with another really fun one. So really excited today to be joined by archeologist Becca Pexiato. She is uh, taking us behind the scenes at the Pro Museum uh, in Texas to check out an exhibition called Origins, Fossils from the Cradle of Humankind. So these fossils were part of an astonishing discovery of over 1500 fossil elements of one of our early uh, human ancestors. In September 2015, they were identified as belonging to a previously unknown early human relative uh, by expedition leader Lee Berger and his team, and they named it Homo naledi. So these fossil elements have been kept in South Africa and for the last several months, they have been here uh, in the United States on exhibit. So this is an incredibly rare opportunity to check out these amazing pieces uh, of our human history. So Becca, we're so excited to have you joining us live today to learn a little bit more about you, about your work, and of course, this amazing, uh, these amazing things that you have here, these artifacts. Thanks, it's, it's great to be here. It's really exciting to be able to do this on the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And um, like you said, I'm in the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, Texas. And uh, my computer is sitting on a case holding some really, really special artifacts. If I tip the screen down there, you can see some, you can see a skull and some vertebra and some arms. There's even a jaw there. These are the bones of Australopithecus sediba. Sediba is about 2 million years old. And the first bones of this species of our ancient human relative were discovered by nine-year-old Matthew Berger. Well, he's not nine years old anymore because that was a while ago. Now he's in college. But when he found the first bone, he was nine years old. Uh, and he and his dad, Lee Berger, were out wandering around looking for, looking for fossils and they found some. And it was pretty exciting to find, to find a whole new species. Um, and it set off this cascade of discovery and exploration that um, ultimately uh, led us to finding a whole nother new species called Homo naledi. And that's one of the ones that I get to research deep down in a cave in South Africa. Um, so since this is uh, uh, Women in Science Day, I wanna just highlight some of the other women who are working on these projects. Um, this is Amy Zhang. She does, um, she helps us understand these bones by creating animation. She does computer animation of the bones so that we can know how Australopithecus sediba walked. So uh, she doesn't do excavations like I do, but she works on the computers. Uh, we have somebody else right here. There's Amanda Henry. And Amanda Henry looks at the teeth of Australopithecus sediba. She does sort of what your dentist does in that she goes and scrapes the plaque from between the teeth of these ancient fossils and then looks at them under a microscope to be able to see what kinds of plants and stuff were stuck in Sediba's teeth two million years ago so we know what he was eating and what his environment was like. And that's, that's pretty cool. Um, it weirds my dentist out though when I tell her about that. Um, and then we have right behind me you can see a rock. This is a solid piece of breccia and it has dozens of bones of Australopithecus sediba in it. Um, if you look real close, you might be able to see a shoulder blade and some curved bones that look like ribs. And sediba's bones are stuck in rock like you'd think of a dinosaur fossils being stuck in rock. And it takes some people with really, really special skills to be able to get them out of that rock. And one of them is my friend Zendile here. Zendile is one of the most um, skilled fossil preparators in all of Africa. And she spent two and a half years chipping very carefully away at the rock to expose all of these bones. So no matter what kind of science you're interested in, if it's computer science or if it's things like dentistry or, or even um, how rock is formed, there's lots of space for women and other people to um, participate in these kinds of discoveries. 
So the piece of this that I'm involved in is the exploration and excavation. So I go down into a cave that's 30 meters underground in South Africa. And Joe, I think you've got a video you can show. I sure do. Let me uh, share my screen uh, to the students, just a taste of what this conditions are like and what the commute is like just to get uh, to these spots. So just bear with me for a couple of seconds while I share my screen. There we go. And let's shift over and there we go. Let's go full screen. Just let me know if you can't see it, but it should be up now. I was the first scientist to go into the cave once the actual remains had been discovered. I looked down and just thought, oh, really? I may perhaps have bitten off more than I can chew. But you know, at the same time, the excitement of what we were about to do overwhelmed that fear. And yeah, I'm perfectly prepared to shove myself where I don't belong. I got this job by answering the Facebook ad. I put a call out on Facebook saying, I need a skinny scientist. We're not claustrophobic in a dangerous and difficult environment. And so I, I applied thinking, well, you know, give it a shot. A couple of days later, I got the email saying, you know, you're in. To, to somewhere entirely new. And I can imagine that's how the, the astronauts felt when they were going out into space for the first time. You just thought, no one else has done this. And, you know, Lee's grand plan, the whole team's grand plan, if there had been a serious accident deep in the cave, was that we would have had to send a medical team to them and they would have had to live underground until they could get themselves back out again. Critical issues, no one panic. Yeah, see, it's a normal commute. <laughs> All right, I'm going to come back from that screen share now that we had a little taste of where uh, those elements came from and I'll let you jump back in Becca. Great, thanks. Yeah, so in order to um, let me back up just a second. In 2013, so about six years ago, some cavers were exploring in a cave system called Rising Star in South Africa. And it was a cave system they thought they knew really, really well. But it turns out there was a whole section of the cave system that hadn't been on the maps and nobody'd really explored it before. So these two guys, Rick and Steve, they went down into this part of the cave and they found some bones. And this was really exciting and they went back and told Lee Berger about it. And then Lee decided it was time to excavate those fossils because he thought they might be something pretty interesting, although he didn't know what they were yet. But um, the cave is pretty small as you could see in, those, in that video. And we've got a mock-up of it here in the exhibit. So let me squeeze in and you can kind of get a sense of what it's really like in there. So that's, uh, if you can see the, the wall of the mock-up here and here, and there's just about enough room for my head in the middle. It's about 18 centimeters wide at, the, at its narrowest point where we have to go. And, you know, it takes some people with um, not just the right size body to be able to fit in there, but also the the right mindset of thinking that, that that kind of thing sounds like fun in order to go down into the cave. You know, I like caving a lot more than I like sitting in traffic waiting to get to school or work. So um, that's sort of my choice. And so we, the six of us who all happen to be women, got to go down into this cave and do these excavations. And we turns out that we found more than 1,500 bones in the first couple of excavations that belonged to a whole new species. So Australopithecus sediba that I showed you a little while ago was 2 million years old and he was found in about 2008. And then in 2013, we found this 300,000 year old species, so much more recent, that we called Homo naledi. And he's more closely related to us than sediba is, um, but he still um, has some characteristics like us that he can walk upright and um, can use his hands for tools uh, to, to use tools, but he also um, has some differences from us in that he's probably a better climber than us and his face looks a bit different from ours. He's got a pretty small brain. But at any rate, we had to um, go deep down into this cave in the dark with the bats and, and all the other cool stuff that are in caves, the stalactites and stalagmites and all of that, um, and, uh, and explore this cave system to try to find out 
what was in here and how did these bones, how did these animals get back into this cave? Uh, and it's, it's, it's good fun, I like it. So I'm gonna just point out a couple of other, um, of other women here that are highlighted in our exhibit. This is um, our friend Mana Dembo and her job is to, she doesn't like to go into the cave, so her job is to study the bones in the lab and try to figure out how Homo naledi and Australopithecus sediba are related to each other and to, and to us because all we have to go from are the bones that we can see. So we can't ask them questions. We have to study the bones to find out answers like that. Let's see. Um, I'm going to walk through a maze of the cave. It's not really the cave. Let's see if I can do this backwards without bumping into anybody. But you can kind of get a sense for what it looks like in that cave from the pictures on the walls behind me. Oop. I don't want to run into anything. Of course, when we're really underground, it's perfectly dark. There's no light whatsoever. It's like if you, if you went into a closet and turned off the light and closed your eyes and put a blindfold on, it's still darker than that underground. So when we turn off our headlamps, we can't see anything at all. Um, so we have to use, we have to carry extra batteries and make sure that we have, there we go, make sure that we have um, good headlamps so that we can do the excavations and see the bones as we find them. This is Homo naledi. Well, this is a sculpture of Homo naledi based on the bones that we found in the Lissetti chamber of the Rising Star Cave. Uh, and he, he looks, this is a pretty realistic sculpture. Um, you know, we don't know what his hairstyle would have been or what his eye color, or the shape of his nose and his lips, but based on the bones that we have, we're pretty comfortable with, with his body shape, how, how muscular he is and how he stands and how he might have moved around. And I can show you those bones. Put my computer down here, tip it over so you can see. These are the bones that that sculpture is based on. And these are bones that we found, again, um, deep underground in one of the remote chambers of this cave system. And you can see how they're all broken into little pieces. Um, and that's just, that's just what happens to bones if they've been sitting in a cave for 300,000 years. Some of them get really well preserved and some of them, some of them don't. But just like with Sediba, we've got some, whoops, sorry, some really fantastic teeth preserved from Homo naledi. You can see his teeth. And they look quite a bit like yours do if you look at your, at your teeth in the mirror. Uh, and that's kind of a neat thing to see that, you know, we can, that's how, that's how they would have interacted with their food and with their environment through their teeth, just like we do. Pretty similar to us. Um, let's see, Joe, what am I forgetting? No, I think that's great. I think that's a great introduction to uh, the cave system and, you know, just how amazing these finds are. I think it's always worth pointing out that, um, you know, when we're looking for early human ancestors, the discovery of a single tooth can be a huge deal. To have so many um, fossils from, you know, up to 18 different individuals is pretty amazing. Yeah, when we were excavating in 2013, we found more fossils, more individual bones than had been discovered in the whole of South Africa in the previous 80 years. And it's not that people in South Africa weren't looking for these bones over those 80 years. They were looking and they were looking hard. It's just that they weren't finding them. And we happened to find a place that had lots and lots of them in it, which was very exciting. All right, pretty amazing. Well, maybe before we turn it over to a little Q&A action, uh, Becca, can you tell us a little bit of um, what you did in archaeology before you ended up in the Rising Star Cave system? Yeah. So before I, um, before I, before 2013, when I joined the Rising Star team, and even since then, I work at a site in um, Virginia in the U.S. called the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, and it is just like it sounds, it's really big, it's sort of bleak, and it's a swamp. Um, lots of water and snakes and bears and other things that want to uh, make you have a bad day, like ticks and mosquitoes and things. But in the 1600s and 1700s and 1800s, the Dismal Swamp was a place where enslaved people um, were forced to work and also where some enslaved people ran away to try to be free for themselves and have communities. And so the work that I do there is about 
um, finding out about those people's lives. We go into the swamp and we explore looking for islands that they would have lived on. And we use lots of different technology to do that. And then we go to those islands and, and we excavate them and find the things that they left behind, evidence of what they were eating or of the kinds of pendants, for example, that they might have, that they were wearing and the pottery that they were using. And this helps us really understand um, these people in the past whose stories didn't get written down, but have really important things to tell us in the present about, um, about what it means to be human. All right, very cool. Well, first I wanna say, I can see we've got viewers on YouTube. Don't forget you can introduce yourself and send us in a few questions. We'll keep an eye out for those, but let's start meeting some of our camera classrooms because <clears throat> I have no doubt they've got some questions for us today. So we're gonna start off, we're gonna go to Mrs. DeMeo's group. They are hanging out with us uh, in Connecticut. So let me see if I can find their microphone. There it is. How are we doing this morning, Connecticut? Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Who's got a question for Becca about her job or the fossils that she finds? Who has a question? How long she's been doing it. What kinds of different artifacts did you find? What kinds of different artifacts did I find? In the cave in South Africa, we haven't really found artifacts other than bones. Uh, and those are the bones that were inside this, that were the skeletons of the Homo naledi that we, that we find in the cave. We haven't found stone tools or pottery or anything like that. But other places that I've worked, like in the Dismal Swamp, we find remains of people's dinner. So the bones of the animals that they were eating. We find pieces of pottery. We find projectile points, or some people call them arrowheads. Um, we find... Um, glass, pieces of glass bottles that they were using and nails and other things like that. Pretty much anything that you might see around you in your classroom could become an artifact for a future archaeologist if it doesn't decompose. All right, great question to start us off. And I think that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, you showed us Sidiba at the beginning. And I think, and you know, in the past, you've talked about how when you found Sidiba, there were other bones of other animals kind of mixed in around the landscape. And then, you know, what makes Naledi so unique is in this cave system, that's the only kind of bones you're finding. It's just those, that, that one set. So that's pretty, that's pretty neat. Yeah, that's a, it's a weird thing about the Homo Naledi site because most places in South Africa, when you find hominin fossils, the fossils of our ancient relatives, you also find fossils of antelope or of um, big tooth cats or other kinds of things that would have been, the kinds of animals that would have been on that landscape but also died in that same area. And in Rising Star, we only have, well, there's part of an owl that we've found, but we haven't found any other animals that far deep in the cave, which gets us, lets us ask lots of questions about what on earth Homo naledi was doing way back there. All right. Let's go close to you. We've got a classroom in San Antonio, Texas um, with Mrs. Trejo. Let me get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, San Antonio? Are we doing great? All right, I see lots of hands. Who's up? Um, earlier, our teacher showed us a picture of um, the archaeologist and um, she was on this like machine and I was wondering like how it's holding itself up. An archaeologist was on a machine. What kind of machine? Laying. It was like laying down. Oh, laying down. Oh, I know which picture you're talking about. That's me laying down on a ladder. And the ladder is propped between two rocks in the cave underground. And I'm laying on the ladder on my tummy, trying to excavate underneath the ladder. And the reason we did that was because the fossils that we wanted were on the ground between those two rocks and you couldn't reach them if you were just sitting on one of the rocks. So in order to be able to get right on top of the fossils without smashing them, we propped that ladder up and tied it with some rope to the, to the two rocks and, and just sort of precariously posed ourselves there on the, on the ladder. It, um, it's more comfortable than it looks, <laughs> but it's also still pretty hard to dig underneath you. I'm sure it starts out comfortable, but after several hours, it's probably not as comfortable as when it started. That's right. And I think that's pretty neat. Very observant from our class in uh, San Antonio. And, you know, a lot of the tools that you, you guys did use were kind of just everyday objects, whether it was Tupperware containers to carry the samples out, 
uh, toothbrushes and toothpicks and um, paintbrushes. Yeah, yeah. Some of the technology we use is really, really high tech. We use these 3D scanners that look like irons and you sort of wave them over, a, over the bones and it makes a 3D image of the bones. And we use things like ground penetrating radar or LIDAR, these real high tech things. But we also use stuff that's really, really low tech. Um, We've, we've used a hair dryer underground to dry some plaster because it's so humid underground. Um, we use nail polish sometimes to make permanent marks on the wall of the cave so that we don't have to keep measuring the same spot over and over again. Um, and then porcupine quills are a really great excavation tool and those are handy because the porcupines drop them right near the entrance to the cave. So we just pick them up on our way in. All right, very cool. Uh, let's see, let us go now. Oh, we've got another group uh, joining us. Looks like Pflugerville, Texas, grade four is hanging out with Mrs. Chambers. Let's get that microphone turned on. <laughs> How are we doing grade fours? Good. 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 You want to come ask a question for us? Yeah, boys, do it. Here, come on, come on. Come on, come on. It's right there. The camera's right there. <laughs> Okay, oh, nice have you found more fossils of relevant? <laughs> <laughs> have, have, have you found more um, fossils of our relatives of humans and apes? Have we found other fossils of relatives of human of other fossils of humans relatives? Yes, I think I understand what you're trying to ask. I can't get it out properly. The question is, have we found other fossils from other relatives of humans and apes? And the answer is yes, we have. Um, so the team that I'm on has found Homo naledi and other teams have found Australopithecus sediba. You might've heard of Lucy is another famous ancient human relative. And we all share a common ancestor way, way, way back, millions and millions and millions of years ago with, um, with other apes, but we, um, the Australopithecines and the, the others in the genus Homo, like us, were Homo sapiens. We sort of split off on a different branch of the family a long, long time ago. And those are the ones that we're finding that we call hominin fossils. It's a good question. All right, great question. Let's go to Festus, Missouri this time. We have grade sixes hanging out with Mrs. Brady. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Missouri? Um, did they live down there or were they chasing food and just died down there? Yeah, that's a great question. Did Homo naledi live in the cave or were they chased in or what happened? So we don't think that they were living 30 meters underground in the dark. We don't have any evidence of, of any kind of activity like having fires or having food or anything like that, that they were living that deep underground. We don't think that they were chased in by predators. We don't see any evidence on their bones of of um, tooth marks from the kinds of animals that would want to eat them. We don't think they were washed in by a flood because that would have um, big impacts on what the dirt around the bones look like and what the bones themselves look like. And we know for sure they didn't fall in from the ceiling like in a sinkhole because the ceiling is a solid piece of chert that is much, much, much older than, than anything else in the cave. Uh, so what we, our hypothesis is that Homo naledi were deliberately disposing of their dead in the cave. So naledi would die somewhere and their fellows would bring them into this chamber of the cave. That's our hypothesis and that's, one of the, that's what we continue to test with our excavations, looking for evidence to support or refute that hypothesis. All right. Great question. And that's what's so awesome about science is... You get lots of questions. Sometimes you go in and come out with even more, but you, you, you got to do some tests and, and try to figure out what's going on. So it's definitely a big mystery, but uh, I think the evidence is pointing towards where you guys are leading for sure. Yeah. All right. Mrs. Paradis's group, uh, they are joining us in Pennsylvania. Looks like some grade six, sevens. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing Pennsylvania? There they are. Um, how could you tell that it was um, different from the other bones, like the other types of human? How could you tell that these new ones were different? Yeah. How could we tell that these new bones were different from any of the other kinds of human relatives that we'd found before? Um, 
it took a little while. It took lots of scientists putting their minds together um, to compare the bones that we found to all of the other bones that had been found in the past. And it's, um, the bones look really similar. And in fact, their skeletons are put together just the same way ours are put together. But there's subtle differences in the shape of their skull, how prominent their brow ridges are, um, how sort of the, what, the, what the shape of the face is like or what individual bones are shaped like. Uh, and so it's just by comparison, sort of laying all the bones out and comparing them to all the other bones that we, that we know about to see which ones look the same and which ones look different. All right, good question. Uh, let's see, Mr. Atkinson's group, grade seven's hanging out in Barrie, Ontario here in Canada. Let's get that mic on. How are we doing Barry? Is Homo naledi your most valuable fossil you found so far and how much would his fossils be worth? <laughs> the question is about how much these fossils are worth. And the truth is that these fossils are priceless they don't really have any value because they're so unique and they're so rare. And, and really, what are you gonna do with one? They don't look so nice sitting on your mantle. So they're more valuable to science and they're more valuable for what they can tell us about ourselves and about our human past than they are in any kind of you know, monetary value. Um, are they the most, are they the most um, scientifically important fossils I've ever found? They certainly are because they were a whole new species, one that we didn't know about before. Um, yeah, so they're, they're really exciting. Absolutely. And, you know, priceless to our human history. I'm sure, though, somebody would buy them. There's all kinds of collectors. So we're glad that they're being kept nicely and safe in the museum. And then they'll go back to their home in South Africa uh, after that. Because it's much better for us to see them than to be on some collector shelf somewhere. So. It is really great to have the opportunity to see something, uh, a shared piece of our history. It's pretty awesome. All right. We need to go to two. Um, whoops, there we go. We need to go to Toronto, Ontario now. We've got some high schoolers hanging out uh, with Mrs. Eugenio. Let me get that microphone turned on. No, oh, there it is. All right, Toronto, we're ready. Hey, guys. <laughs> okay. Hello. Uh, so I have a question uh, regarding what you said earlier about how humans uh, diverged from our common ancestors. So what exactly was this change and what could have possibly caused it? Those are huge questions. The question about what caused the change and um, what caused human evolution and what exactly the specific changes are. Those are huge questions that scientists are still working on. So some um, causes of the changes over time in human relatives um, would include the environment, environmental pressures, um, the, you know, the change from being a, a animal that walks sometimes on two legs and sometimes uh, using all four limbs or climbing in the trees to being an animal like us and like Homo naledi that walks all the time on two feet. Um, that might have to do with environmental pressures and um, other kinds of, um, other, other factors, um, but there's not really any one specific answer. You know, I can't tell you that um, humans started walking upright because it was faster to run, because that might've been part of, the, part of the cause, but not the entire cause, right? There's lots of different factors that go into this. Um, and some of those changes, the specific changes include this upright walking, it includes a larger brain size, and there's lots of theories for why um, our brains got bigger. You know, Neanderthals had larger brains than we do as Homo sapiens. And did that have to do with the ability to cook, or did that have to do with other things? Uh, you know, getting more calories from cooking and causing your brain to grow bigger, or did it have other factors involved? Um, probably the answer is yes, all of those things together, lots of factors combining. Um, let's see, what other kind of changes do we have the ability to use tools and the way that the way that our hands are structured so that we can have nice fine precision grips that's something that that sets us apart from some of our other relatives um, and the shape of our teeth for example our teeth as modern humans our teeth get smaller as you go back in our jaw and um, homo naledis for example their molars their last molar is bigger than their first molar 
And one of the causes for that change might be that Homo naledi was chewing a lot more, so their teeth were getting worn down, and they had just generally more room in their jaw to have these larger teeth. And we, we cook our food, we eat softer food, our teeth don't get so worn down, so now there's not quite so much room, and lots of us have to have our third molar or our wisdom teeth removed. So it's hard, it's frustrating to not be able to pinpoint one thing, but it's also really cool because that means there's lots of different investigations and different kinds of science we can do to try to understand what was happening over the last couple million years and is still happening today. Absolutely. That's a really good question and a really hard question that, you know, a lot of work is going into right now because these gradual changes took place over millions of years across you know, different countries. So you're really just finding little clues every once in a while, little puzzle pieces and trying to fit uh, everything together to try and create this family tree and see, uh, you know, how things shook out. Uh, we've got a great question uh, from a homeschool group who's tuning in from Montreal uh, in Quebec. And they're wondering if there are any clues as to what Naledi might've been eating. Um, yes, there are some great clues to what Naledi was eating. Uh, so if we look at Homo naledi's teeth under a microscope, we can see tiny, tiny scratches all over their teeth. And this gives us a clue that they were eating some pretty gritty foods, foods that had, you know, maybe small bits of dirt or grit on them. Things like um, roots, uh, root vegetables, tubers, things that were growing under the ground that you might pull up and just chow down on that still had some grit on them. Um, we also know that their teeth were really, that we see a lot of wear in their teeth. So they're, they're using their teeth a lot, which means they're probably chewing some pretty tough foods, to, um, tough kinds of vegetation uh, that take, you know, a lot, a lot more chewing. Like, I don't know, I think of, I have to chew asparagus a lot more than I might have to chew uh, a potato that's cooked, right? So it's food that has to get chewed more than, than other kinds. Um, not that Naledi was eating asparagus or potatoes. That was a modern example. Um, and whether or not they were eating meat is a little harder to tell. We think that they probably were. They weren't eating meat exclusively because they don't have those sharp, pointy carnivore kind of teeth. Um, and eating meat doesn't leave the same kind of marks on the teeth like these gritty foods or these tough foods might. But we, we think that they have teeth similar to ours that are capable of, of eating some meat. So they probably were eating some, but we're still trying to figure out how much. All right, great question. Um, so we still have a few more minutes. So uh, what I'll do is if there's classrooms that still have another question, if you wanna send someone right up to the camera and that'll be my signal that we have to go back to your group, but I can see our Pennsylvania group right away, we're ready uh, with another question. So I'm gonna start with them. Have we found new species other than the other other than the Homo naledi? Like, are we certain that the Homo naledi bones that we found? Are we sure that it wasn't from another from another species? Yeah, that's a great question. How do we know that Homo naledi is is just Homo naledi, and how are they? You know, maybe there's some other bones someplace else that are also Homo naledi, or Homo naledi belongs to some other species. Uh, and that's part of how this science works, that we, um, we look at the evidence that we have, in this case, these bones, and that they don't look like anything else. And then as new evidence comes to light, we might have to revise our, um, our knowledge, which is something we've been doing for, for decades when we talk about human origins. Um, an example of a more recently discovered species than Homo naledi is, um, is called Homo luzonensis. And that one was found in the Philippines just a couple of years ago. Um, and those are new bones that don't look like anything else, at least so far, they don't seem to look like anything else, but they are, um, they do look like they're related to us somehow. Uh, so we're always finding as more exploration is done, we're finding more examples of our ancient human relatives and trying to, as Joe said, piece these puzzle pieces together. You know, we find some teeth and a few bones in the Philippines and maybe they match uh, something that's similar in that area, but probably they don't. There's something that's really unique. Just like when we find a lot of bones in South Africa, they seem to be unique um, compared to all the rest of the bones that we've found. 
we hope that maybe someday we'll find more Homo naledi in a different cave system in South Africa. That would be really cool. Or maybe the team in the Philippines will find more Homo luzonensis someplace else in that area. And that'll just help us better understand how big these populations of our ancient human relatives were and how they were interacting with one another. There's lots more to discover and it takes, uh, it takes scientists willing to go, go out and, and do that exploration to, to make these discoveries. All right. Mrs. Brady's group in Missouri, I see someone front and center. Do you think they communicate more like humans or animals? Mm, how did Homo naledi communicate? We don't know. We know that they have a small brain, but that brain has development. It's got, you know, sort of all of the wiggles and folds like our brain has on the surface of it in places similar to where, where our brains are well developed for things like communication and, and bigger thoughts. Um, but we, they didn't leave us a podcast. So we don't know how they communicated. You know, we don't know, could they, did they have language like we think of it or did they communicate in some other way? All right, great questions. Our classes are really thinking today. Uh, let's see, let's go back to Toronto. I see someone in Mrs. Eugenio's group. Um, hi, I was just wondering, uh, when you're doing the excavations, do you camp out near the cave or do you go home? And how long do you work during the day? Like how many hours do you work? Yeah, that's a great question. How long do we spend underground and what's camp life like? Um, so it takes us, well, in 2013, when we first started going underground, it took us about 45 minutes to get from the entrance through all of that wiggly stuff you saw in the video down to where we do the excavation. Um, nowadays, we're all in a little better shape and we know it better. So it takes us 20 minutes or 25 minutes if we're not carrying anything, but upwards of two hours if we're carrying fossils back out of the cave. Um, so it's sort of a mission to get there. And we try to spend six or seven hours underground at a time because it's so long to get there. Um, the, the amount of time we spend underground is often dictated by um, when we need to use the restroom. So you have to allow yourself plenty of time to get back out through those tight squeezes um, at the end of the day. And then sometimes we will stay on site. We'll camp there at the, at the entrance to the cave system, not underground. We don't spend the night underground, but we'll, spend our, we'll stay um, on the surface near the cave system sometimes. And sometimes if we just have a few of us working out there and we're doing a small expedition, we'll actually drive back into Johannesburg. It's uh, about an hour or so to Johannesburg from where, we, from where we work. We'll drive back in and stay in town. And, and that's nice to have a nice hot shower once in a while. All right, fair enough. Mrs. Trejo's class, I see someone really close. I think they're ready. When did you decide you wanted to be an archaeologist? When did I decide I wanted to be an archaeologist? I love this question because I didn't even know that archaeologist was something that real humans could be until I was going back to graduate school when I was in my mid thirties, I was already a grown up and had already had a different career when I learned that you could actually be an archeologist. I saw archeologists on TV and you know, I went to museums and I knew they existed, but I never knew that a real human person could be that as a job. So I didn't decide I was gonna be an archeologist till I was already well a grown up. But I had done lots of things before then like um, leading wilderness expeditions, doing caving and rock climbing and mountaineering. And I'd studied science and I had all of these other kinds of experiences that when I did decide I wanted to be an archeologist, they helped me out. And they really helped me out with all that caving and rock climbing I had done um, to join the Rising Star Project and work on Homo naledi. All right, I think I see someone in Mrs. DeMeo's class. Let me get that microphone turned on. We're ready for you, bud. What did you go to school for to be an archeologist? What did I go to school for to be an archeologist? So when I first went to college, I studied engineering um, and then I changed my major partway through and I studied something else altogether. When I went back to graduate school, I studied anthropology. In the United States, um, archaeology is sort of grouped with anthropology. It's all about the study of humans, and archaeologists study humans in the past through the things that we leave behind, all of our stuff. Um, and so I was studying anthropology about 
you know, there's a lot of history and there's a lot of um, how do we use all these different technologies and how does excavation work and how do we put um, all those lines of evidence together to be able to tell accurate stories about life in the past. All right, and I think we're going to be able to make it through each class because it looks like most classrooms have a follow up. So Mrs. Chambers group, I can see someone. Thank, waiting. You. Thank you. Hi, Don't worry, bud. Do you have any evidence of Bigfoot in what's the most interesting artifact that you found? Do I have any evidence of Bigfoot and what's the most interesting artifact I've ever found? I do not, I personally do not have any evidence of Bigfoot. Um, although studying the feet of these human fossils, these human ancestors and relatives is pretty interesting because they can tell us about how, how they walked and how much they walked. And even with Homo naledi, we have an example of a Homo naledi who, who broke their toe one time. So like he stubbed his toe and broke it and then it healed and got better and he carried on living his life. So the feet of these human relatives are pretty interesting things to study about, about how they were moving around. And for me, the most interesting artifact I've ever found, it's a tie. So in, for Homo naledi, the most interesting thing I've ever found was a hand. We found almost all of the bones of, your, of a hand. There's 26 bones in your hand and wrist. We found almost all of those laying in the dirt in there, just as they would be if they'd been in life with the fingers curled over and the thumb sort of sticking out. That was pretty exciting. And then the other, other kind of artifact I found was in the Dismal Swamp. We found a pendant that was made by someone in the, probably in the 1700s out of a, 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 a soapstone bowl that had been made probably several hundred years before. So it was somebody reusing something to make a pendant to wear around their neck. And that was a pretty exciting find too. All right, very cool. And then Mr. Agnes's group and Barry, do you guys have one more? Um, were you ever doubtful that you would find something important in the caves? Were we ever doubtful that we'd find something important in the caves? Hmm. When, yes, I would say we were, you know, it's, it's this exploration thing takes a lot of, of um, repeat, we have to do it over and over and do it for a long time before you find something. But uh, so Lee Berger, who, who runs the project that I work on, um, he had a long time where he was doing exploration and looking for fossils and not finding anything. And then eventually he refined his methods and learned better places to look. So um, it's a little bit of luck and a little bit of, of knowing how to look efficiently for different things. So yeah, there's some times when we're like, oh, all we're finding today is just pieces of rock. We're not going to find any more bones. And then there's other days that we're finding loads and loads and loads of bones. And both of those are interesting to us because they're both evidence of, of what was going on in the cave. All right. And I was going to wrap things, but I'm looking at the, our class in Missouri and I see someone in an orange sweater has been standing the whole time. So I'm going to stop in there one more time. Uh, what, was a, like, what was a bone that showed the most evidence? Ooh, what was the bone that showed the most evidence for Homo naledi? Hmm. So for lots of the fossils that we find in other parts of Africa and South Africa, a lot of times we find the skull or we find the teeth. And in 2013, we found part of a skull of Homo naledi. And so that gave us something that was easy to compare with all of the other skulls that had been found or parts of skulls that had been found. So that was a really good piece of evidence that we could say, look how these bones, skulls, their heads are different from all of these other uh, human relatives that we have the skulls of. Um, and, and that helps us see that they're, that they're a different species. It's a good question. They're all good questions. All right. Well, Becca, a huge thank you for joining us today, especially uh, being that it is International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And thank you for being such an awesome role model for taking you know, exploration, mixing it with the science and just bringing amazing things to the public. So uh, it's so awesome that the artifacts, the bones get to spend some time here in North America uh, and that you're giving people a chance to see uh, these priceless pieces of our human history. So uh, classrooms, a huge thank you to all of you for the awesome questions. Thanks to the YouTube viewers as well. And uh, yeah, Becca, it's always great when we 
we make these connections. And I'm a little sad that next month could, is probably going to be our last one. It's been a lot of fun doing these connections all the way through. Yeah, it's really fun. I love all the great questions. Thank you to the students. All right. Awesome. Well, boys and girls, the last thing I'm going to do for today is I'm going to unmute the microphones. Let's get a little bit loud. A big goodbye and thank you to Becca. And then we'll sign off for today. So the microphones are on. Bye. Awesome work, everyone. I knew you'd be good for that. Uh, join in for the rest of today. We still have more events coming up today and a lot of amazing events coming up through the month uh, with all kinds of different women in science, exploration, uh, archaeologists, marine biologists, astronauts, you name it. We've got quite an amazing group uh, of guests coming up. So we hope to see you in more events uh, throughout the month. So thanks, everyone, for joining in. And we're going to sign uh, off for today. <laughs>